Why is there a blank space here? No, 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 here, hold on. There are a few. How many continents are there? Have we seen that one? No, I don't think we have. Here, we'll go with that one. How many continents are there? I, all I can hear is her screaming. I feel like certain aspects of femboy philosophy's tweets seem to be implying femboys are more oppressed or have it harder than women, cis or trans, even though his original tweet was talking about fetishization specifically. I'm sure there are things about being a femboy that are harder selectively than being a woman in the same way that, like, because women are expected to be women, but men aren't expected to be femboys, you know? So there's a deviation uh, or from, from norm or from expectation. Like being a gay man, right? I mean, like, like, you have male privilege when you're a gay man, but it's not quite the same because a lot of your, you know, we can't really hear pigeons screaming mostly bothers you. Yes, it does bother me significantly. Yes, absolutely. Hold on. Soon be allowed to go on holiday Ta-da. again. When you look at the world map, it's immediately obvious how many continents there are and which countries belong to which ones. No, it isn't. That's right. That's why we're doing an episode about it. Welcome to Map Men. We're the men, and here's the map. All British primary schools rated at least satisfactory by Ofsted will teach their children that there are seven continents. Wait, we did this one? Okay. No, we didn't. Oh, fuck you guys. Europe, Asia, Africa, Australia, Antarctica, North America, and South America. But other countries' curriculums beg to differ. In parts of Europe, they teach just six continents. In Russia and Japan, they teach a different six continents. And in South America, they teach just five continents. So who should we believe? Whom should we believe? Exactly. The most common definition of a continent is a large, continuous landmass separated by oceans. I like that definition. It's exactly how I imagine a continent. Good for you, Mark. Now take a look at a world map and tell me how many large, continuous landmasses are separated by ocean. Great. Australia? One. North America? <coughs> it's attached to South America. But the Panama Canal? Is man-made and definitely not an ocean. Point taken. So, all of America? Two. Antarctica? Three. Africa? <coughs> Africa is only separated from Eurasia by another man-made canal, the Suez, so it doesn't fit the definition. I see. So, Afro-Eurasia. Congratulations! So, according to the most common definition, there should only be four continents. Also, the largest of these, Afro-Eurasia, contains 86% of the world's population, making it a useless distinction. I don't like this definition anymore. Neither do I. So, can we instead use another, more sciencey definition? We can. The reason the Earth's land masses are as spread out as they are is because the tectonic plates that make up the Earth's crust have moved them apart over time, and using the major tectonic plates as our guide to the continents, we get a more even distribution of where they are. Tectonically speaking, North America is separate from South America, Africa is separate from Eurasia, and Antarctica and Australia are separate from everything. Nice and simple. But on closer inspection, this tectonic definition also has some major issues. For example, Australia. The country of Australia is this bit, but the tectonic plate, also called Australia, includes Australia and a bit of New Zealand, and half of the island of Papua, which includes both Papua New Guinea and the province of Papua, which is in Indonesia, which is in Asia. Which is confusing. So, to avoid this country-continent muddle, other names for this continent do exist, including Sahul, Meganesia, and Australinia. Not to be confused with Australasia, an increasingly unfashionable term describing Australia and New Zealand and some but not all of the Pacific Islands, so we're not going to mention it again. So then, what continent does New Zealand belong to? By both our definitions so far, none. Good for New Zealand. What's wrong with not belonging to any continent? Not being able to take part in the Olympics. Mm. Because this famous four-yearly competition to see who can host the best fireworks display is open to every country in the world, its five continental rings must somehow include them all. Each ring represents a different continent. There's Europe, America, Africa, Asia... And this one represents a broad region including Australia, New Zealand, as well as the Micro, Mela and Polynesia... countries known as Oceania. Oceania, its very name meaning the opposite of continent, is not considered one by any strict definition, but it's a popular term, especially for the purpose of making sure no country misses out on being in continent. <laughs> Only Antarctica no. doesn't get an no. Olympic ring because it's no. too cold to host a fireworks no. display. No. 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 The tectonic and Olympic approaches could be easily combined, including both Antarctica and Oceania, giving us a nice problem-free six continents. Except it's not problem-free at all. We need to talk about Europe. Whether part of a landmass or a tectonic plate, Europe appears to be nothing more than a glorified Asian peninsula. So, 
what actually is Europe? Can it really be possible that the home of the continental breakfast isn't even a continent at all? And if so, what do we call that breakfast other than disappointing? Which brings us to a third element to consider in the definition of a continent, culture. Knowing which continent a country is in immediately tells you something about what it's like. And because Norway has more in common with Sweden when it comes to language, religion, ethnicity and favourite cutlery than it does with, say, Vietnam, a line is helpfully drawn here, breaking Eurasia up into two bits. But complicated culture can't be conveniently cut into clear categories. Some countries cause tremendous headaches for this dividing line. First, Armenia, a country which, with a 95% Christian population, arguably falls in the Europe category, but geographically belongs to Asia. And, speaking as someone who's a 32nd Armenian, where do you think these eyebrows come from, I can confirm I have no idea what continent it should be in. The second problem country is Turkey, which incessantly prides itself on being an Asian-European hybrid. Food? Asia. Trading partners? Europe. Religion? Asia. Writing system? Europe. This leaves the dividing line with no option but to split Turkey's largest city, Istanbul, straight down the middle, misleadingly suggesting that the populations either side of the Straits of Bosphorus are somehow totally different from one another. One way of solving the problem of where the line goes is to insist that it doesn't exist. Which is the approach taken by Russia. Which should come as no surprise, because it's in Russia's interest to view Eurasia as a single continent. If it's divided, that might make people think they're different from each other. And when people think they're different, they like to talk about things like independence. To make matters messier, some European countries have significant territories in other continents. The largest part of Denmark is officially in North America. And France, with dozens of overseas territories, has put bits of Europe in Africa, Oceania, both Americas and Antarctica. Perhaps the best example of the difficulty of pinning down what is and isn't Europe can be found in the insufferable Eurovision Song Contest. Insufferably fabulous! In its first These nuggets year, are so seven good, man. very European countries took to the stage. Belgium, France, Italy, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Switzerland and West Germany. But with more countries wanting to get in on the poptastic action, this quickly expanded, adding transcontinental Russia, dubiously European Georgia, Asia's Israel, Africa's Morocco, eventually giving up the geographical facade altogether with Australia's Australia. What Eurovision demonstrates quite well is that continents are all about politics. Every continent now has some form of political and economic union. There's Mercosur, the African Union, ASEAN, and of course the EU. But these organisations are rarely drawn on the same lines as the continents themselves. Despite the number of people who confused Britain leaving the EU with Britain leaving Europe, it remains something which, tectonically speaking, we can't actually have a referendum on. The underlying question in all of this is, why does it matter how many continents there are? Should we even care which one we belong to? Well, no, not really. What the continents really represent is a human desire to use broad generalisations to categorise the world into arbitrary subdivisions. So whether it's seven, five or even six continents, these subdivisions will remain as useful as they are argued about. Are you really a 32nd Armenian? Yes. Because I'm a 23rd Hawaiian. Are you really? No. Hello. Bonjour. With tra I'm not done with the nuggies. I'm not done. I'm not done. Time zones are silly. Hey, Mark, what time is it? Hang on. Let me just... OK, let me just decode the... It's the afternoon. Welcome to Map Men. We're the men. And here's the map. Map Men, Map Men, Map, Map, Map Men, Men, Men. Back in the olden days, people would tell time by the sun. What time is it? I don't know, I've gone blind. But then, in the 18-somethings, when they invented trains, suddenly it mattered what the exact time was. One man famously travelled from London to Bristol by train, and then the time was ten minutes different, and then he missed his train home, or something like that, and so standard time was invented. For a short while, some towns were using both local time and railway time, but this confusing, cluttery clock-up just made even more people miss their trains. This is the East London suburb of Greenwich, where you don't pronounce the W or one of the E's. And right here is the place where British Standard Time was standardised. Since 11 o'clock in the morning on the 2nd of August, 1880, it's been exactly the same time all across the British Isles. Greenwich Mean Time. Greenwich Mean Time started a trend and soon became a standard the world over for your local country to be a certain number of hours either behind or ahead of. Here is a map showing all the time zones around the world. Each bar is measured as the number of hours before or after Greenwich Mean Time, or UTC. But as you can see, the lines are not straight. 
They bend slightly around country borders, as you might expect them to, but what we're interested in is how they bend massively around weird things, as you may well not expect them to. So, here's our Map Men guide to the world's best time zone anomaly 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 anomalies. China. China is one massive time zone. They've done this for unity and simplicity, but it has a few consequences. If you cross the border from Afghanistan to China, time jumps ahead by three and a half hours. Tea time, dinner time, tea time, dinner time. Secondly, and much more importantly, in Tibet in winter, the sun doesn't rise until 10 a.m. Because of this, some people in Xinjiang have adopted their own local unofficial time zone. But the Han community who also live there refuse to recognize it. All efforts to correct this have inevitably failed. Unity and simplicity, my front bottom. America. In Arizona, there are some areas that do observe daylight savings and some that don't. This means that for half the year, driving through the state means you have to keep a close eye on your watch. She's going to be okay. She's going to be okay. Oh, it's too late. I couldn't save her in time. Everybody's going to hate me because I... Oh, thank God. I'm, I'm going to make it. I'll be a hero. She'll survive. Oh. Changing the hour is one thing, but the most curious curiosities happen at the controversial and ever-changing international dateline. The line where Tuesday changes into Wednesday. The Diomedes. The Diomede Islands live here, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. This one to the west belongs to Russia and is the furthest east you can go in the world. And this one to the east belongs to America and is the furthest west you can go in the world. The international dateline splits these two islands doing the muddle, which means that even though they're only two and a half miles apart, there's a whole day between them. During the Cold War, a woman called Lynn Cox swam from one to the other across the so-called Ice Curtain, drawing congratulations on her brave statement of peace, even though all she really wanted was for it not to be Monday. Kiribati. Kiribati. Really? Yep. Hmm. For many decades, Kiribati was on the right-hand side of the dateline, and they were the last people on the planet to do anything. But this caused a problem. Every Friday morning, when the Kiribatians were eager to do business with their biggest trading partners, Australia, the Aussies were sleeping off their Saturday morning hangovers. <sighs> Not now, Messina. So, on New Year's Day 1995, they jumped across to the left-hand side of the dateline, skipping a day ahead to join their business partners in Hangoverland. Why are you still calling me? This meant that Saturday the 31st of December 1994 never happened. As a consequence of Kiribati changing from one side to the other, the international dateline now looked like an Easter Island head. And their time-travelling tactic triggered a trend. Boff. In 2011, they were joined on the new side of the dateline by the nation of Samoa. Samoa. Really? No, I don't know. That's what we love about the lines on this map. They don't show distance from Greenwich, semicolon. They show a rich tapestry of culture and allegiances. The surprisingly sinuous zigs and zags of the world's time zones demonstrate that it is not time that controls us humans, but rather us humans who control time. Well. Us humans who control time. Well. Us humans who control time. Where well, us humans who control and time. Pace where well, us pace humans and who control pace time. And well, pace Stop doing that! Oh, Mrs. Doubtfire! Okay, we're almost there. Oh my god, we're almost there. We're so close. We're so close to eating all the nuggies. We're so close. Agreement. Welcome to Map Men. We're the men. And here's the map. Map Men, Map Men, Map, Map, Map. Men, men. Today's map is a 2015 map of the border between India and Bangladesh, an area riddled with enclaves. An enclave is a piece of country wholly surrounded by another country, like a tic-tac inside a polo. This is a piece of Bangladesh which is in India. And this is a second order enclave, a piece of India which is in Bangladesh which is in India. And this is the world's only third order enclave in the world. A piece of India, which is in Bangladesh, which is in India, which is in Bangladesh, which is insane. Like a tic tac inside a polo, inside a bagel, inside Bangladesh. The problem for people living in smaller enclaves is they often lack access to basic resources, with the two countries often unwilling to share. Worse still, with many enclaves too small to support their own emergency services, neighboring paramedics awkwardly refuse to cross borders. <laughs> The cruel irony is that in order to leave their enclave, residents need a visa, which they can only get by travelling to their embassy, which they can only do if they have a visa, which they don't. So how do we end up in this ludicrous situation? Amazingly, historians aren't really sure. All they know is it was the result of a confused end to a war in 1713 between various princes who couldn't be bothered to use a map to draw a clear border. Calm down, Mark. Oh, fine, but they should have used a map. 
Back in the 18th century, these patches of who owned what didn't matter like they do today. It was only when, you guessed it, the British came and went that the two provinces became separate countries, who incidentally hate each other. The simple thing to do would be to swap these enclaves over, but for India, this was a problem, because it would send out the wrong message. Hello? Hello, Pakistan? It's Bangladesh. India are giving land away. India are giving land away? Hello? Hello, China? It's Pakistan. India are giving land away. India are giving land away? <laughs> But, in 1974, enclave dwellers were offered hope when the two sides put together an agreement to swap their stray bits of land. Both sides signed it, and then Bangladesh ratified it. And India didn't. Oh! 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 So rude! Oh! 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 Cut. India decided they weren't happy with the small print, and the dispute continued... <coughs> ...for another 40 years. But! As recently as 2015, India finally decided to put people first. And they ratified the agreement. On August the 1st, 2015, 161 enclaves were ceded to the country that contained them, setting thousands of people free. And so we must pay our respects to this once great map, now sadly consigned to history. Mark, save some for me. Okay, we're here. I finally finished. I hope Vivian is watching this, because this is like me undoing all the anti-Anglo sentiment that I've had on stream for years. I guess so, Radical Reviewer. They're nice, aren't they? Ugh. <sighs> That's true. She can't see my stream. She's too busy on um, on Prime Kai. <clears throat> that was surprisingly quite fascinating, actually. Yeah, yeah. Oh, God, it's so spicy. That was so much. Okay. 